title of our presentation is called Supporting and Advocating for Your Child. Uh, when we're talking about supporting and advocating for your child, we're talking about um, your child, e either can be your child, can be uh, your niece, can be anybody who uh, you have personal contact with, uh, could be your sibling for, for that matter, um, who uh, struggles with uh, concurrent mental health disorder as well as a uh, substance use disorder or uh, is tending towards an addiction. Uh, so uh, we've already been introduced, so I'll just move on. I will be speaking, followed by Sydney, and then you'll hear back from me again, and then uh, Angie. So as um, uh, the um, host, sorry, Andrea um, mentioned, we are a national charity uh, grassroots organization that uh, was founded by parents, uh, for parents of children who struggle with a concurrent disorder as well as a, a substance use disorder. Um, so as I said, we're all volunteers and our focus is really to support uh, parents and families, caregivers, and to also offer education and advocacy with respect to these issues. We have, uh, as I said, uh, three main goals is the support of families, of friends, uh, sorry, uh, families, parents, and caregivers uh, of a loved one who struggles. Um, and uh, then we have the education advocacy, but tonight uh, my focus at this point in this webinar is to talk about how we support families. So um, we have parent supporters and we have uh, a variety of different parent uh, support programs. And as I said, uh, we don't only support the parents of children of whatever age, we, it's also um, open to uh, siblings, aunts, grandparents who might have a loved, uh, loved one who is also struggling. And so our parent peer supporters, the people who support the parents who uh, have children in their lives who are struggling, are trained and, uh, and they're also volunteers and they're parents with lived experience. So uh, they're unique in the fact that they are coming from a lived experience lens and that we offer training to them through um, what we call the invitation to change approach. And this invitation to change approach is offered by the, the Center for Motivation and Change in the US. What it is, is a compassionate approach for encouraging behavior change. Basically, you're, you're hoping to get some behavior change from your loved one. And how do you do that? Since you can't change anybody but yourself at the end of the day, but if you, we give you skills, and that's what we impart to the parent supporters, uh, then we can give uh, skills to those, the parents on how to um, create change with their loved ones. Um, this invitation to change approach draws on evidence informed principles and the practices of craft, which is the community reinforcement and family training, motivational interviewing and acceptance and commitment therapy. Our resource, our largest resource for any parent and all of our parent supporters is this book called Beyond Addiction. So I, I really encourage anybody who reaches out to us to pick up this, this uh, very trusty, helpful resource called Beyond Addiction, available uh, anywhere, basically easily accessible through Amazon. Um, and it's uh, really, uh, it gives you the tools uh, of, of the invitation to change approach so that you can uh, create change in behaviors and also support yourself through this process. So as I mentioned, we have support, three types of supports for families and caregivers. One is the one-on-one -on -one parent peer support, so we call it the P2P. And this is a, a photo of our parent volunteers who all have lived experience and who offer um, back, uh, give back to the population who reaches out to us for the supports. As, and as I said, they're all trained. This is one of our training sessions when we could have them live. We also offer group support and that's four times a month. All our services are free. The P2P, the group support and the telephone support, which Sid will talk about uh, momentarily. They're all free and they're all across Canada. Uh, the uh, bonus about uh, this group support is that uh, they, anybody can call uh, four times a month 
first and third Mondays in the evening, 7 p.m. Eastern, and first and third Tuesdays at noon. So there are a few, a few options. And once again, these are manned by parent peer supporters who are volunteers. Sydney. Yeah, so our live telephone support line um, has really been designed to help people when they actually need the help in real time. And um, it's not a crisis line, uh, but it is there to support the people. And it also supports our other programs. So uh, when there's not a group support or your P2P calls, then you've got um, a resource to reach out to at any time. It is open every weekday between one and three in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. And we really do get calls anywhere from people wondering if their child has an addiction and what that looks like, right through to um, my child is really suffering with major concurrent complex addictions and mental health. So we really talk to anybody in regards to mental health and addictions. So we wanted to talk to you sort of about some of the strategies that we deal with and, and to help uh, parents get through and what are some of the key points. Education is definitely one of the key points and it's a lot of times where I start with families because a lot of people don't know what it is that they're dealing with. So understanding the definition of addiction is a good place to start in that, as we know, it occurs when people can't control their use of alcohol or other drugs. Uh, even though there's negative consequences, it's a loss of choice. And historically, the, the general public has looked at people with addictions um, as a moral failing. And addiction is a brain disease because the drugs are changing the brain. It changes how the brain works, especially the brain's natural inhibitions and the reward centers. Addiction, though, is a treatable illness. So people meet criteria for a number of reasons, um, the amount that they're drinking over a long period of time, unable to control their use, strong cravings, lots of time spending, obtaining, using, and recovering. I could go on, most of you sort of know what that looks like. What's in really important to uh, realize at the same time though, particularly with youth, is up to 90% of youth that are struggling also have a concurrent mental health issue. So that's always important to keep in mind. And that the mental illness, you know, we know that that's a condition that affects a person's, their thinking, the feeling, their mood, um, and it affects their ability to either relate to people right through to simply functioning each day. So mental illness also changes the brain work. So having both of these concurrent illnesses is really difficult. We wanna be shifting people's perspectives. We need to make sense of their behaviors. So sometimes they will say, um, helps me mellow out. I'm less stressed, depressed. It helps me forget, or it helps me focus and concentrate or sleep or simply face the day. So learning what those underlying conditions, what's motivating, what's the why behind the substance use is what we're looking for. And as I've said, you know, that helps you mellow out, it, less stressed, someone could have anxiety, less depressed, uh, forgetting focus could be ADHD. So what's the why behind what we're talking about? And we also need to realize that there are huge biological links. We know that addiction runs in the family and the same can be said for the mental health issues as well. This could look like selfish behaviors, being lazy, being mean, abusive or destructive, but this could be the mental health or addictions at play here. So we need to really listen to what they are telling us. We can't dismiss it because there's a lot of truth in what they are saying to us. So we need to pay attention, but we need to do this without judgment and without shame. That's really important. So it's important for us to have realistic expectations about recovery. Addiction is a chronic disease. It's not really acute. It needs to be managed over a long period of time. And it's pretty unusual for a person to recover and never relapse. So I think it's also important for us to be very open about new pathways of treatment, like 
the decision between complete abstinence or harm reduction approach, which is a new wonderful model that is showing some really great success. Staying balanced, though, I think is what's really important here. We've got mental health and we've got addictions. And so as they're getting help with the mental health, and the addictions, it's keeping them balanced or if they're doing harm reduction and reducing their use as they're slowly building the skills, that's gonna be easier for them to be dealing with that kind of thing. Staying engaged is also extremely important. It's showing love and it's showing support. And when we're removing that judgment and shifting our perspective, understanding this is a health issue, we become a part of the solution. And it's our influence that can have a huge impact, especially for this ambivalence, which for them is really hard to get around and actually understand that they have a problem or wanna deal with the problem. So educating ourselves will actually contribute to better outcomes. So here's some tools for parents to help their children. Talk about it. Talk about it in terms of an illness. Help them understand that. Active listening listen to hear, no talking, no advice or some feedback, and find those alternate behaviors. Listen to recognize what's driving these behaviors, and then you can start finding alternative or healthier ways for them to be dealing with these, i.e. maybe getting some therapy, some help along the way. Ask questions. This is what I didn't do a lot. I did a lot of assuming, and when I finally did get around asking the questions, I found out I was wrong. So now I ask permission. Um, they're the ones that have all the answers. So we've got to figure out a way to really be telling or getting their story out of them. That was one of the bi biggest successes for me with my son was I found a time where I could talk to him and say, hey, you know what? I don't get what you're going through. I don't have the same situation. Help me to understand what does it feel like in your brain when you're dealing with these issues? And what do the substances do for you? And I got a huge lesson and learned quite a bit, which helped me to in turn help him. So the other thing that you could be doing is catching them when they're good, because that doesn't happen very often. The attention is paid when they're bad. Um, we need to change that to reward for good behaviors because that helps to lift their mood and encourages more good behaviors. Our role is to slow down and get out of a reaction mode. So think about what really matters to you as a parent. What do you value and what do you care about? What kind of parent do you want to be? And to be kind to yourself. Behavior changes are actually very slow sometimes. And so change takes time. We need to be consistent. We need to set the boundaries and choose our words thoughtfully. So if we can go to the positive reinforcements, um, I want to give you some strategies for positive reinforcement. So again, we need to turn down the heat, encourage and demonstrate some positive behaviors and shifts that will help the shift the ambivalence and open up some doors for some better communication. So behaviors being open, plus the response and appreciating our positive response equals an effect, which is more likely for them to be open again. It's kind of learned behavior and changing the way things might have been in the past. Positive communication, we need to really pay attention to our word choice, um, even so much as our stance and our tone. They're really paying attention. They're hurt by so many things. They're listening to the way we are speaking. We could be using the right language, but our stance and the tone is not matching what we're doing. So be aware of those things. Be brief, don't say more than what's necessary and be specific because vague requests are sometimes hard to understand or can be ignored. And labeling what you're feeling, use I statements when you're talking about you, that's awfully important. Offer understanding statements. But don't use the word, I understand. That was a big mistake in my world. I kept saying, oh, I understand. But I didn't because I don't have this. And my son was very upset with that. So try to find that language that your child is uh, struggling with and, and the ones that's making them more positive. Um, and offer to help. And try to phrase it in, the, in a question for them, ask their permission. And sometimes you could say, when you're ready, 
I'm here for you. And I love you and I wanna support you. So a few more helpful hints, uh, celebrate the wins. Even if it's a small win in the right direction, they're going in the right direction. That's something to be really happy about. Using the right language again, as in, you know, are you staying clean? Saying those kinds of things could mean to them that they are dirty. So we want to avoid addict, junkie, that kind of language that has very stigmatizing um, images for them uh, that is stigmatizing. One of the ways that really helped me to do that was I was dealing with uh, my father having cancer. So I decided to look at my son who has an illness like he had cancer. What would I be saying to him that's different than what I'm saying to him now? How would I be supporting? How would I be helping him knowing that he has that kind of an illness? So lastly, self-care is, is definitely very important. And there are three domains to self-care. Physical self-care, which looks like nutrition, sleep, and time outside in nature. The mental self-care, meditation, journaling, and seeking out help for yourself, and an emotional self-care. That would be boundaries for yourself, connections to family and friends so you've got somebody to talk to, and self-check-ins are a really good idea. The awareness, you know, what we want to be aware of is that there are huge connections between the physical and our mental health, and this does take a big toll on us, so be aware of what's going on with yourself. Soothe yourself. So switch the focus from my kid comes first, which many of us tend to do, and me later. It's you first. It's like the airplane scenario, the oxygen comes down. We always put the oxygen mask on first and it's our child second. If we are not, gonna, if we are not in a good place to help our children when they need us, we're not gonna be there for them. Um, Eckhart Tolle had a great quote that is acceptance of the unacceptable is the greatest source of grace in the world. Um, this is radical acceptance. So accepting life on life's terms is important and not resisting that life just as it is. So deal with reality, not the way that you wish it was. So accepting is not agreeing, but it's creating a really good space for them to be them in the moment and for us listening and embrace the imperfect mess and know that we can only do the best that we can and really the rest of that is up to them. So take a pause, especially if there is a really stressful situation that might be a minute, that might be a day. Pause and collect your thoughts and find the right things to say. Keep asking yourself. How do I want to be as a parent in this situation? And self-compassion is encouragement to acknowledge and include yourself in this experience with a lot of kindness. Louise? Thanks so much, uh, Sid. A lot of great skills. Um, I'm going to add to those and there will be a little bit of overlap from what you've heard from Sid. And that's just the invitation to change approach. We have a lot of skills that we um, are keen to impart uh, to parent listeners. And so uh, there will be a little bit of overlap and I'm going to try to use some, some real life examples. Um, so another skill that we encourage you to do is to be collaborative with your child. Let's face it, you know, when their, their behaviors are less than ideal and uh, they're you know, slamming the door in your face, swearing at you, calling you names. It's hard to not um, react. And as Sid say, said uh, previously, um, it's, it's best if we don't. It's, so it, it's, it's taking a pause, like Sid said, and, and start to appreciate, okay, this is going to, have, going to be going to be taking me to a, a worse place than what I feel right now. And I need to, to pause and I need to listen and observe what's going on around me. Um, the time to have conversations with your child uh, is not when they're tired, hungry, or under the influence of drugs, um, but outside of those times. So 
might be after a good long rest, might be in a car when everybody's peaceful and you're just going from one place to another. Um, they're almost like captive. And they, those moments are really golden, particularly with teenagers who might just give you some sort of grunting noises. Um, so what we encourage you to do is uh, use those moments and, and really be active in the listening component. Uh, we love as parents to talk. We love to talk and talk and talk and you know, you should do this and you should that. And my favorite saying is nobody likes to be should on. And if you're shooting on your child, they're not gonna like it. Or if you're talking too much, this is why you need to do this because then this and that and this and that. And they're, what are they gonna do? You can just imagine what they're gonna do is shut their ears, right? So what we need to do as parents uh, to promote more speaking is to do less talking of our, of our own. So active listening. Um, another way to be collaborative is to ask those open questions, right? Uh, open versus closed. So open meaning you want to elicit a response that is longer than just a, a grunt or a yes or no, right? So um, in those moments, once again, where the child is not um, in a place where it's not conducive to conversation, okay? And I think that Sid also mentioned uh, that we want to catch them being good. So um, when, when we're talking about that is um, they Believe it or not, your child, if they're not um, meeting your parenting norm or the behaviors that you're expecting uh, from them, they, uh, they, they might feel ashamed by it. Like, so they didn't get an A on a test and they didn't turn in a paper and they got a failure or whatever. Um, and that's just school related, right? So um, if, if they did get a result, then comment on it and, and leave it at that. I noticed you worked hard and you turned in that paper on time and I'm really proud of you. And that's it, right? Imagine if you did that, if, if you did that every single time, you know, you, you, some, some of us want to add to that dialogue and say, you would be able to get A's in class, et cetera, et cetera. So say less, listen more. Is, uh, is a great strategy that we encourage our parents uh, to have. And not just a parent of a child who might be using problematically. Um, so another key skill that we really uh, encourage is to have some empathy. So it did touch a little bit on the empathy part is trying to appreciate where they're coming from. People use drugs for a reason, but find out those reasons. Uh, uh, appreciate what it is that is leading them to that place and also acknowledge and validate why they're using. So I, I remember when I had a moment with my daughter and she was extremely low. And instead of arguing with her about why she's low and how, she, how many things she had to do, uh, I said, it must be really hard for you. And that's all I said. I didn't add more to it. I wanted to see if I would elicit a response. And I got one because uh, I was there for her and she knew that I heard and saw her and that empathy goes a long way. So imagining where they're coming from is really a, a strong skill that we encourage. Um, another skill that we like to impart that we've learned through the invitation to change approach is to set boundaries. Uh, you might be asking, so like, you know, I do set those boundaries, the curfew, it's broken every night, you know, um, so what I, my question to you is if you're doing those boundaries, try to try to set boundaries for you, not for them. So how that works is uh, when you want to set a boundary for behavior, such as you can't smoke pot in our house. Is that a boundary because you don't like the smell, it's safe, you have younger children in the house? Those may be very good reasons why you don't want your child smoking pot in the house. Uh, so th those are boundaries for yourself. So these are my rules from this house. And the hardest part is actually sticking to those boundaries. So if they break a boundary or you suggest also, this is my boundary and you can highlight your reasons for your boundary and an alternative. Because we know that if we say you can't do drugs period, chances are they'll still, drug, still do drugs. So um, it's just a matter of where. So if we offer the option of, we don't want you to do drugs in this house and these are the reasons why, 
you're welcome to do it at the far end of the backyard, wherever uh, we won't have any risk of X, Y, and Z. Okay, so those that's a healthy boundary for you and you're setting the line in the sand for him or her to follow. Um, so our question is that that is why you want that boundary because that's how you want your life to be uh, in this house. So you want a peaceful, serene environment, not one that is constantly being pushed by this boundary, okay? Um, that can lead you to some natural consequences, right? I'll talk about shouting or anger uh, later. Um, so the natural consequences is something that can happen as a result of a breaking a boundary or a natural consequence. Perfect example is your child not getting up every morning and you decide you're, it's your role to get them up and get them out the door and drive them to school. So my question is, what would happen if you didn't do that? And so that's, so, so some of the skills we uh, impart through the invitation to change approaches, we ask the parents uh, that we support a lot of questions. If they say to us, well, if I didn't wake him up and drive him to school, or if they respond to us, um, that if I didn't wake them up and drive them to school, they wouldn't go to school. And then my next question would be, so what would happen if they didn't go to school? Right? So we see that there are some consequences that fall into place naturally for the child. If we always, um, don't like to use the word rescue, but always help them get to where we think they need to be, then they don't pick it up for them to acknowledge their responsibility in that moment to get to where they need to be. So we want to encourage behaviors that would uh, that would lead to um, you know either uh, a natural consequence that would encourage them to change a behavior. Okay. So a few uh, more essential skills learned from us is you're really not alone. And that's really part of our program, our support program is, and that's the, big, the biggest thing that we offer is that it can be very isolating for a parent who has a child who struggles. And we get it at FAR Canada. Um, and this journey, uh, it, we know what it's like. We, we, we hear you and uh, you, you can be assured that you're not alone struggling through this. So reach out for help. Um, you really have no control over anybody else, especially not the outcome. Um, so the only person you have control over your, is yourself. And the sooner we recognize that, instead of trying to control our child to do um, behaviors that are uh, more desirable rather than less desirable, the better, the more peace, internal peace that we gain as parents. Sure, they might not uh, continue, they might continue to have behaviors that aren't manageable, but we really don't have control over that. But what we do have control over is our response to them having those behaviors and, 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 and setting the boundary. So I noticed last night you broke for, as an example, you broke the wall uh, and, and I'm not very happy about that. How do you feel about this? Uh, can we have a conversation about this? And then you know, see how it, see where it goes. Because um, ignoring behaviors that are, are that are, are are not conducive to your healthy household is uh, is not helpful either. And remember that recovery is a process. It's not a linear line. It's more of a line like this or a line like this before you get to your designated target, where you want to be, where you want to be as a parent and where you want your child to be as, as, a, as an individual. So you have your own journey like this uh, alongside your child, but what your goal is to uh, have um, a, an outcome that is more peaceful for you. And internally, what happens is when you have more peace in yourself, in your household, it translates to your child recognizing that you are a different person than you were before as a parent. Angie, I'm going to uh, log out so you can log in. Thanks, Louise. Did I do that? No, stop. Here we are. Got it. Oh, okay. Skip ahead there a bit. Okay. Um, so 
you know, no discussion on how to support your child if we're talking about substance use is really complete without uh, at least a brief overview of uh, the concept of harm reduction, which really is uh, as much and all as we'd um, all love to be able to control uh, the use of substances by our children. Um, uh, that's just, you know, it's not in our control. So you could say, you know, we really hope you don't use, you know, uh, substances until you're older. Um, uh, but in the meanwhile, just in case you do. Uh, and there are, there's a section on our website on what to tell your kids about drugs. And there's a lot to be Google harm reduction. There's lots of information on how to use substances more safely. The two things I want to draw to your attention today, because they're both potentially life-saving, is uh, I, I think everybody who has a teenager really should have a naloxone kit at home. Uh, it reverses uh, an overdose of opioids and it's important, you know, even if your child, you know, uses stimulants or if you have no idea what they're using to have one of these kits, there's no downside to using it. If, if you find someone, you know, it's passed out and you can't revive them, you can use it, it will not cause any harm. Uh, and um, you can get them free of charge uh, in any drugstore in Ontario. And the second thing is, you know, a lot of people will not use uh, supervised consumption sites, and uh, it, it is dangerous to use substances alone. And and uh, some, some you know some kids do this. And and um, there's now a national overdose response service, NORS.ca. Uh, and uh, if if your child calls first, um, they will uh, make sure that they're responding. And if they stop responding, um, you know, they will uh, send EMS. So uh, that's a really good service to know about and to talk to your child about. And I really would encourage everybody uh, to have the harm reduction uh, conversation with their with all their children, whether they, whether you think they're using substances or not. Just in case there's no downside, that certainly sends a message of unconditional love. I'm just trying to, oh, there we go. Um, in case you're thinking that's a little far out for you know, a talk to people with younger children, uh, unfortunately, uh, opioids are involved uh, right now in, um, well, in 2019. One of six deaths of kids 15 to 24 was opioid related. It's really shocking. Uh, back in 2015, it was one in nine. And in 2020, uh, which is the last year we really have numbers for, um, it, it increased by 34% again from 128 um, youth to 172. Uh, and honestly, I think that's closer to one in five or maybe even one in four deaths of, of youth in that age range. So uh, that is something um, to realize that this, this is happening. So I want to turn to advocating for your child. There's really um, two areas. I mean, there's two types of advocacy, right? There's advocacy for your individual child, which is really important because basically discrimination and stigma has resulted in a lack of funding um, to treat uh, addiction and mental health, uh, not just in Ontario, really everywhere. Um, and CAMH has estimated that the underfunding is about one and a half billion every year in, in Ontario. Um, and so there's a huge lack of resources. So it's important for you to really advocate and, and um, help your child find the services that they need. Um, and secondly, our policies right now, um, you know, our policies all should be uh, looking at protecting youth who have a problematic substance use, you know, not not everybody needs protection from themselves. A lot of people can use, including youth, uh, substances without incurring harm. Um, but for those of us whose children do struggle with a substance use disorder, um, th there are lots of barriers and, and problematic policies, frankly. So uh, at the systems level, uh, which also is going to require a tremendous amount of work, um, there's advocating for more resources. So we have treatment on demand, um, Nobody's going to be surprised, you know, if I say sometimes people, you know, don't want help when other family members think they need it. Uh, and um, so it's really important when somebody's ready that 
that the services are available. And we really don't have that. And there's less services for youth actually than adults, especially with respect to residential care. We need more harm reduction services as well. And yes, even for youth. And we need protective health laws and protective drug policies. So I'm going to go into that. For, this is really high level overview. Um, uh, I do want to tell everybody at the end, we've got a couple pages of resources. You know, I can talk probably for over an hour on each one of these topics. So this is very high level. Uh, there are two points I want to make before I get into the protective health laws drug policies, because I think it's really important to keep this in mind when you're advocating. And the first is there is kind of some bad news, and that is that addiction is a pediatric illness. And the, the, the worst part of this is most people don't know that. And what do I mean by that? I mean, if your child starts to use substances before the age of 15, they're six times as likely to develop a substance use disorder than if they start at 21 or later, which is actually part of why in the US the age uh, to legally um, uh, buy alcohol and cannabis where it's legal is 21. And 90% of the time substance use disorder begins in adolescence. The second thing, and it's good news, is that the brain has neuroplasticity, uh, which, which means it can heal itself. So this really drives home the importance of early intervention. Um, so the green line here shows you that when a person who doesn't have substance use disorder uses a substance, they get a peak in pleasure and they return to the baseline. And that's how it goes. People who develop a substance use disorder, they're coming down below the baseline um, the more they use. And they end up in this place where after a while, they're just using to try to get back to normal. Um, so they can be pretty much sick all the time unless they use. And they describe it as a place of misery. So the good news about that is it means over time, you know, um, People come to realize that the substance use, which you know might have been their main coping mechanism, has now become their main problem, and they they do want to uh, get better. And the red line is showing what can happen to the brain in recovery. It takes time; it's not linear, but they they can they can recover. So, with respect to health laws, what do I mean by protective health laws? Uh, in 2010 the government of Ontario traveled the province actually in 2009, and they set up a committee to look at what, what wasn't working for mental health and addiction. And not surprisingly for families, it was the issue of involuntary treatment and privacy laws. And I'm not gonna talk about privacy laws today. Um, again, the resources at the end will, there's lots of material on that. Um, but I do wanna drive home the problem with involuntary treatment, this was really, the fact that it's, you know, obviously helping people who want help is best, voluntary services are best. There's no question about that. Uh, but it's not surprising, I think, to most people that inherent in uh, substance use disorder and other mental health conditions, sometimes people don't realize they're ill or they don't think their illness is bad enough to get help. And um, so there's this tension between their right to refuse treatment and their right to be well or their right to health or their right to life. Um, and the government recognized this tension and they said, we, you know, our laws right now aren't allowing us to protect people. They're talking about adults, not, not children. Uh, well, both, but um, not just children. And so they acknowledged that part of this means, you know, people are ending up, uh, they're ending up in jail, they're ending up homeless and, and they're ending up in more. Uh, so we need to do something. And, um, the, they suggested we change our laws with respect to involuntary treatment and uh, with respect to uh, privacy to allow families to get the information that they need. And the government in 2011 said they were going to do that and they've done nothing ever since. And that's got a lot to do with, uh, there's a very big advocacy um, group, you know, in, in terms of human rights and, and they view this as a violation of rights. and. Um, so what's happening is we have, for example, in BC, Allie Thomas, who died at the age of 12 from her fourth overdose. She had refused treatment three previous times. Um, and that means our physicians are not uh, applying um, our mental health acts properly or assessing properly for capacity to make treatment decisions. If somebody has to have capacity to, to make treatment decisions. It also includes 
if they're refusing treatment, they have to have capacity. And unfortunately for people with substance use disorder, you know, um, their lack of autonomy often is with respect to their use, they can't stop. And that's the same thing as really saying yes to abstinence-based treatment. Um, so there's another example as well of Elliot Urchuk who died at the age of 16 of an overdose again in BC. Uh, but this could, eat, I mean, it is happening in Ontario, absolutely. Um, and it, his case is remarkable because his parents told the hospital uh, where he was getting help uh, that they planned on taking him to the states for treatment against his will because in the states parents can consent to treatment on behalf of minor children for substance use disorder and we can't in Canada and uh, the social worker at the hospital said that they were going to report them for kidnapping if they did that and they did not take their child to the states and he died shortly thereafter in an overdose at home. The arguments against involuntary treatment are usually that it's unethical, it's ineffective and traumatic. Um, frankly, I think the status quo is certainly unethical and traumatic. It's traumatic living with untreated addiction and mental illness. Um, you know, to be it's unethical to respect someone's uh, right to um, refuse treatment and self-harm to death when they don't want to die and they have a treatable condition. And the issue of effectiveness, there is actually no compelling evidence either way. There is a culture in Canada that says it doesn't work. Um, but it's honestly the wrong question because involuntary treatment is there to solve a problem of when somebody doesn't have capacity to make treatment decisions. And if somebody is at serious risk of harm to themselves or others because of their mental illness uh, and they're not seeking treatment, treatment. Um, and to say it doesn't work really um, is to say, so we're not gonna intervene, is to say we're gonna let them self-harm to death or harm other people and then arrest them. So the other way we can protect people um, is our drug policies. And that's what prohibition is supposed to be doing. So by prohibition, I mean, we've decided some drugs are legal, some are illegal. Uh, and so we're protecting people from illegal drugs because they're bad. And um, if we say it's illegal to use them, people won't use them. Except of course it doesn't work. I mean, it, right now, if you ask any of your kids, they'll probably tell you it's just as easy, maybe easier to get illegal drugs than illegal drugs. And um, this, this is a really important chart. Um, it's a little dated, it doesn't include fentanyl. Um, but it shows that the greatest amount of harm um, is, is coming from alcohol. Uh, and the red line is actually harm to others as opposed to harm to, to, to uh, self. And alcohol is the only substance where there's greater harm to other people um, than uh, to yourself. So when you think the criminal laws are there to primarily to protect people from other people, not from themselves, uh, it is sort of backwards that alcohol is, is the one that, that is legal when some of these other substances that aren't that harmful are not. So drug, drug policies are two things we could do. We could decriminalize drugs and we could regulate them. And decriminalize just means uh, we're not gonna arrest you if you're in possession of a small amount of drugs for personal use as opposed to trafficking or, or sharing um, with other people. And there's lots of reasons to decriminalize. Uh, today, the um, Alberta Medical Association came out in favor of decriminalization. Uh, previously, the Canadian Society of Addiction Medicine, uh, the Canadian Medical Association, the College of Family Physicians of Canada, and most surprisingly, the Canadian Association Chiefs of Police have now all come out in favor of decriminalizing drugs. Um, and, you know, the the only thing I wanna say on this, because I don't hear other people say it and I, I don't know why. Uh, again, the purpose of criminal law is to protect people from other people. It used to be illegal to try to attempt suicide in Canada prior to 1972. And most people say like, that makes no sense. You're not gonna help people that are clearly in a mental health crisis uh, by criminalizing them for uh, self-harm. And it's only a matter of time before we, we, we make these changes to our laws here to protect people with substance use disorder because when you consume a substance, you know, primarily either it's not a problem or it's a problem for you. If it goes on to be a problem for other people because, you know, of assault or, you know, driving impaired, we already have those laws um, that, that make those harms to other people criminal. So we really don't need to criminalize possession for personal use. 
This chart uh, shows that the best approach with respect to substances is to regulate them because that is the only way people can have agency over using them. Um, and uh, that harms are actually maximized if we have a, a you know, a, a, a profit, a corporate profit commercial uh, model, or if we have an illegal model. Um, this is a little bit dated. Alcohol should be on top of tobacco. It's, it's more harmful uh, right now overall uh, in Canada. And cannabis, of course, needs to come over to the right-hand side. But um, the, the public health approach that is best for minimizing harms is uh, market regulation. So where does this leave us? Um, right now, if your child uh, you know, isn't safe in the community because they're using illegal substances and they can't stop, um, they're playing Russian roulette with their lives. And the wait time for residential treatment at uh, Pine River Institute, which is really the only long-term residential treatment in Ontario is 14 months. And there's over 200 youth on the wait list. Um, and so there simply isn't treatment on demand that's residential. Um, we also know that a third of people dying from drug overdoses actually um, don't have a substance use disorder. So, that speaks to the importance of regulation. But for those who do, um, you know, we need, we need safe consumption sites and a regulated supply even for minors because there's no residential treatment on demand to keep people safe who need treatment. Uh, and uh, there's no ability to intervene if they're having problem use. And if we could intervene, um, see one above, they're gonna, they're gonna wait 14 months. So what do we need? We really need the general public on our side. We need to do a lot of advocacy work so people can understand this. Um, I think this is a great quote, justice will never be served until those who are unaffected are as outraged as those who are. And it's pretty outrageous when you've got a 12 year old dying from a fourth overdose. So the last part of our presentation, each one of us wanna give you some parting thoughts. Um, so uh, here they are for me. Um, listen more, talk less. Uh, I absolutely <laughs> wish I'd done this. Uh, it did become my mantra uh, pretty soon into my, my son's uh, problematic use. Uh, you know, it, it was just sort of like shut up, Ange, and it always served me well. I never regretted keeping my mouth shut. Um, the other thing that I've learned is children and parents are doing the best they can with the coping skills that they have in the moment. Um, you know, it can be bad behavior, but uh, it's actually lack of coping skills as well. Uh, and, and when they develop these coping skills, uh, the behavior improves. And that includes for parents as well. And most of us can look back at something we've done and have regret. Um, so it's important to forgive. Forgive your child if they're, they're harming you. Uh, forgive yourself if you think you could have handled something better and move on. Um, be the squeaky wheel, especially when it comes to advocacy. Um, there aren't enough resources. You need to get in there and try to elbow your way in and make sure your kid gets the help they need and certainly into that. And the last thing is this too shall pass. That became another mantra for me when thing, things seemed really bleak. And I can tell you, they always did pass. Sometimes it got a little worse before they got better, uh, but they, you know, it really did pass. Um, so over to Louise. All right. So uh, my parting thoughts and my lessons learned. Is Sorry about that. Anger really doesn't help. And I did um, want to talk about that in my skills learned. But boy, did I learn that one because what anger does to you as a parent doesn't put you in a great spot, makes you your blood pressure rise, makes you you know, look to your child like you're a demon and your child starts to not listen. So check in with yourself, take a pause, hit the pause button because we know that anger doesn't help. And that's something that I had to learn the hard way. Uh, empathy. I did talk a little bit about empathy, but I, I saw some shifts in my daughter when I started to feel empathy for her. And then the last one is that shame. Oh, wow. Shame is carried by all of us. It keeps, it's a barrier that keeps us from seeking help for ourselves and help for our loved one. And I'm not only talking about shame that the parents or the family members carry around. 
Imagine the shame of your child who uses and does things that are less than, than desirable, the shame that they feel uh, for their behaviors. So if we have shame, empathy goes a long way. And that's normal to have shame. We need to work through it and, uh, and, and reach out for help. You're not alone. Sid? Yep. Can you advance this? Thank you. That's great. So these are my three that I really did think were important. Um, honoring their perspective. I think that's really important. Whatever they're telling you, it is their perspective. And they are coming from a sick brain and we're coming from a healthy brain. And so it's different. So just validate, let them know that they've been heard. That's really important. And respect, respect was huge with my son. As soon as I stopped that anger and that those behaviors and really started respecting and honoring and validating what he was going through, it was kind of a game changer. Um, and then hope is one that I think is extremely important and goes along with that shame. We need to take the shame off their shoulders and replace it with hope because they don't have hope. The stigmas, the everything that's going on, the providers that are doing it, society that does it, family that does it. We need to let them know they're good people, that there's great chance for them to get hope. One of the really great strategies I did quickly with my son was I got him to do one of those boards where we stick all these ideas up on it. And I wanted him to have an idea, a five-year plan. Where do you want to be in five years? Forget about this illness, but what does this great life look like? And we did it in great detail. And then I said, what's your first step to get there? Because we can get there. And he had hope and every little step along the way we got really excited about and celebrated. And five years later, he was living exactly his dream. So hope is a very powerful tool. Thank you. 